This week, I have been going over the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith because someone is interested in becoming a member. So in admitting someone into membership, we review the confession. But why do we do that? We do this because the confession sums up what we believe rather well, and it is a great way to communicate to someone those beliefs. Today, we speak about providence. And if you will allow me, I'd like to read you what the Confession says about Providence, as it's a good summary of this idea. This will be from the modernized version of the 1689 Confession. It says this about Providence. God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and things from the greatest to the least, by his perfectly wise and holy providence, to the purpose for which they were created. He governs according to his infallible knowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his own will. His providence leads to the praise of his glory, of his wisdom, excuse me, his providence leads to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. All things come to pass unchangeably and certainly in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, who is the first cause. Thus, nothing happens to anyone by chance or outside of God's providence. Yet the same providence God arranges, yet by the same providence God arranges all things to occur according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or in response to other causes. Let me read one part again that I wanted to emphasize. Thus, nothing happens to anyone by chance or outside of God's providence. You see, God is not a master chess player. He does not make decisions in reaction to what we do. He has a plan, and everything goes according to plan. And that's something to ponder over, isn't it? That's that's something we could spend much time thinking about in relation to, I don't know, how prayer works and how we ask for things. Well, in Matthew 24, Jesus reveals a bit of this plan, and he reveals this plan before it happens. Sometimes we call this prophecy. And because everything that Jesus said actually happened, we get a great glimpse into this thing called providence or how God governs the world, and how he makes things happen according to his plan. We get to see God working out his plan to perfection. That's exciting to me. I don't know if that's exciting to you. Now, what happens might not seem pleasant, the circumstances that actually happened, but it still happened according to plan. Now, last week we touched on the first few verses of Matthew 24, so for context's sake, I'll just discuss that briefly. Jesus left the temple and the disciples then pointed out the temple to him. So that was interesting. Jesus had been there. Why did they need to point it out to him? Well, uh, Jesus had pronounced judgment on Israel. And after Jesus was shown the temple by the apostles, uh, they were as they were trying to convince him of the merit of the temple, Jesus shocked the apostles. He said that the temple would be destroyed. The apostles then asked when this would happen. And they asked about the very end of the world. So, might I point out to you again this breakdown of Matthew 24. I put that on your bulletin. We have in the first three verses kind of an introduction. In verses 4 to 35, we see the destruction of the temple being addressed. And then in verses 36 to 51, we see the end of the world being covered. The apostles asked when the temple was going to be destroyed, and they also asked about Christ's second coming and the very end, and then Christ addresses that. So he addresses their question in order. Originally, I'm not sure if I said this last week, but originally I wanted to cover up to verse 35 today. But my eyes were bigger than my stomach, I suppose, when, when planning. I bit off more than I could chew. So we will only get to verse 14 today. 
but we see again from verse 4 to 35, this is a section about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And the last few verses from 36 to 51, we are told about the end of the world. This is very important for you to understand uh, if you are going to comprehend the ideas in this chapter. People get this quite confused. Our friends in the dispensationalist camp get this uh, mixed up. And they have, uh, maybe you've seen them, the very elaborate end times charts. And they see current events in the newspaper or on the news. And they think that, oh, well, this is happening in the world. In the world so this is a sign of the end times. And they point to the sections in Matthew 24, specifically in, section, in this section about the destruction of the temple, and say, well, this is a sign of the very end. But if we look at the text, we'll see that Jesus is actually talking about the destruction of the temple and not something that specifically happens at the very, very end. The destruction of the temple is just the beginning, the very beginning of the end. It's not something that we see only at the very end. And I'd like to point this out to you uh, by looking at these verses ahead of time before we dive into the text verse by verse. So look at verse 6 momentarily. And Jesus says, See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. They're still talking about the temple, 70 AD. Verse 8, all these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. Still talking about the temple. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This is not to say that the end is coming when this happens. It is happening later on. And as we go through this section, we will see more of this language that uh, clearly illustrates this, this breakdown. Um, if you look at the um, very beginning of verse 36 in your Bibles, it's clear when Jesus starts talking about the very end. It says, but concerning that day and hour... Speaking of the end, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And it, it, when you're reading it, it seems like in verse 36, he starts a new thought. He says, but concerning that day, speaking of the very end, and then he elaborates. So it seems like everything um, until verse 36 is talking about the destruction of the temple. And as we go through these verses, I hope to make that clear. Now, I will say that these things that are mentioned in this section about the destruction of the temple do happen today. They started during this time of the destruction of the temple, during this era between Christ's resurrection and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Um, it, it was specifically very noticeable, these things that we'll discuss, these signs that we will discuss in this window of time, but we still see them today. Today will be a bit more of a history lesson than normal, but I hope you'll bear with me because the context for this chapter is very important for you to understand if you're going to grasp this chapter. So in Matthew 24, Christ tells us about very specific happenings, very specific things that the Jews, the apostles that are with him, are going to see. They're going to happen. And I'll call them points of providence. These are things that Christ tells us will happen in the short-term future. Um, and again, he's with the disciples in 30 AD, or the 30s AD. Some people think it's 33, some people think it's 30, whatever. In the 30s, and all this will happen by about 70 AD. So what does Christ tell us would happen? Well, First, we will see false messiahs and false prophets. And I'm going to lump in verse 5 with verse 11 here. And we'll start in verse 5. It says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about being led astray and the importance of being careful because Christ said in the previous verse, See that no one leads you astray. And he says this because... There are many coming in Christ's name, saying that they are the Christ. And those people will lead many astray. In addition to false messiahs, we see in verse 11, 
false prophets. Christ says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So how did that play out in history? We're going to see if Jesus' words stack up to what actually happened in history. And I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, they do. Everything that Christ said would happen did happen in this window of, of time. But it is believed that there were at least 16 false Messiah-type figures that popped up in those few decades. Very uh, prominent leaders uh, that had gained a following as these false messiahs that were leading people astray. If we're talking about a 40-year period, that's a false messiah that's, uh, that's coming into the public eye every two or three years. This is a person who claims to be Christ. And again, I want to point this out. They actually have followers. They are, in fact, leading people astray. This isn't uh, a crazy person out in the wilderness who thinks he's Christ who's by himself. This is a person with influence. In addition to these false messiahs, again, there would be many false prophets who, while not claiming to be Christ himself, would still teach false things. And um, in God's providence, we have the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church. And so the book of Acts says much about this kind of thing. And as we study this text, just keep in mind, that the book of Acts takes place in this window of time that we're looking at, somewhere between 30 and 70 A.D. Now, the book of Acts tells us about um, two of these false Messiah-type figures. As soon as Acts 5, very early on in the book of Acts, it says, For before these days, the Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. These people were following these men as if those men were Christ. The first figure mentioned had 400 men following him. So the warning from Jesus here makes sense, doesn't it? Shortly after Christ's resurrection and the church forms, there are men who are leading hundreds of people astray. We also see false prophets springing up, such as Acts 13.6's false prophet Bar-Jesus. The verse describes him as a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. If you remember that story from Acts 13. So there seems to be an increase in false teachers and leaders in those times. And there still are today. The first signs mentioned here still remain with us today. As we said last week, we must be very careful as not everything labeled Christian is actually as it appears. And I won't uh, stay on that point much longer than as we discussed it last week. <laughs> Moving on, verse 6 and, and part of verse 7 say... And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now again, we're talking in the context between 30 and 70 AD. I want to drill that in, into your mind. Before this, there was a period of time when Rome enjoyed relative peace. This peace occurred because if anyone rebelled against Rome, they squashed it pretty quickly. Rome was very powerful. They had soldiers spread all across the empire for such occasion. So it was a kind of imposed peace, but it was, uh, it was peace, I guess you could say. But as time grew on, there were wars within the empire. If you are a studier of history, you, you will know that in the 60s, the Jews and the Romans got into it um, in, in various wars and various conflicts. And there have been a number of ancient historians who wrote about how the Jews clashed with the Romans. I'm going to give you a few examples then from the first century. These numbers are coming from Brian Borgman's sermon on this text, which I highly recommend. Brian Borgman is a Reformed Baptist preacher who I 
really enjoy. Um, he cites a war in Caesarea that cost 20,000 Jews their lives, a war in Alexandria where 50,000 people died, and one in Damascus which claimed 10,000 lives. These are just a few examples of wars that uh, happened, uh, most of them right before 70 AD. And these wars just happened in this small window of, of time. The Jewish wars. Now certainly, people living in Jerusalem would have heard about a war in Caesarea. It was very close to Jerusalem, just, just like right there. They would have heard about these wars, and they would have heard rumors of wars. And we still have wars today, and Jesus says that these things must take place, and they still do. They are a part of the end, just the very beginning part. They've been happening for a long time now. So there is a direct application to the disciples and the people living in Jerusalem in the first century, and these truths remain with us today. But it's not something that we should um, look for in the newspaper and say, well, there's a war breaking out in such and such a place. Clearly, the end is coming in the next few weeks. Some people do this, and um, they are in great error. Verse 7 also mentions famines. Well, there was a famine in Acts 11. Acts 11, 27 and 28 says, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, yes, Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And Luke adds here in the book of Acts, very helpfully, and uh, Luke always, kind of, always seems to have these kinds of details in his writings. He says, in parentheses, this took place in the days of Claudius. So this great famine, this worldwide famine, took place under Claudius' reign. A quick internet search, which I had to do, <laughs> uh, told me that Claudius was the fourth Roman emperor, and he reigned from 41 to 54, safely within that 30 to 70 window, that 30 AD to 70 window that we're talking about. So there's your timeline. That proves that Jesus, again, was correct um, that you're going to hear about wars, you're going to hear about famines. This is just one example of a great worldwide famine that happened before the destruction of the temple. And we're still in verse 7 of Matthew 24, looking at a, another thing that Jesus predicted, that there would be earthquakes. Great amount, a great amount of earthquakes. One commentator writes, and I may pronounce some of, mispronounce some of these places, so please forgive me. He says, And as to earthquakes, many are mentioned by writers during a period just previous to 70 AD. There were earthquakes in Crete, Smyrna, Miletus, Chios, Samos, Laodicea, Heriopolis, uh, Colossae, Campania, Rome, and Judea. I probably pronounce about half of those correctly. <laughs> Sources also say that there was an earthquake in Pompeii in either 62 or 63. That's not what did Pompeii in, but it was um, a devastating earthquake in Pompeii. One source said that researchers say that uh, the earthquake could have been 5 to 6 degrees on the Richter scale. Not only did Pompeii get destroyed in that earthquake congregation, but the source continues by saying Naples and another city also needed repairs. To better reflect the strength of this quake, they were compared to the 1906 disaster that struck San Francisco. At that time, an earthquake of a similar magnitude killed 3,000 people and destroyed most of the city. Pompeii suffered the most as it had tight buildings and a large population. So it seems as if there were a lot of earthquakes in this period. Verse 8 says that all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. And as I've said a few times now, these are signs of the end, but the very beginning of the end. Um, we still see um, earthquakes, they still happen today. And I'm not saying that they didn't happen before this period. But this was a sign for those in the first century that um, there would be a, a great amount of earthquakes. 
that period of time. So we, when we turn on the news and we hear of an earthquake somewhere in the world that was of great magnitude, we should not say, the end is coming next week, or whatever people say. We shouldn't set a date because we see an earthquake. We have to be very careful not to abuse this passage. So we will move through these last points rather quickly. In verse 9, we see tribulation and persecution. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So, who were the first persecutors of Christians? It wasn't the Romans. It was the Jews that first killed Christians. The Romans just joined in later. We see this in the first martyr, Stephen, and we see that in Acts 6 and 7. Stephen was stoned to death for simply believing in, believing in Christ and preaching Christ. Many are still killed today for simply naming Christ as their Savior. Jesus said that Christians would have three things happen to them. They would be delivered up, that is, turned over to people for punishment, and they would be killed and hated. And when did people really start to hate Christians? Well, if you're a student of history, or if you just read the book of Acts, you'll see that Christians faced this persecution just about when the church started. There wasn't much of a, a, a large time period when Christians were uh, not noticed. Very shortly into the history of the church, it began to be persecuted. And so we cannot say that this great persecution is a sign of the very, very end, as this persecution started as soon, basically as soon as the church started. It was in this period between 30 and 70 A.D. If you look at the life of Paul, you will see that he was turned in and uh, he had to give an account of his life or his, his dealings and he was delivered up. This all happened in the book of Acts and we can study what the Romans did to Christians in the first century as well through secular history. We see this in this time frame. Now with persecution comes apostasy. And so Jesus continues, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. When the pressure is turned up and people start getting killed and you must choose between bread and the Bible, people start to compromise, unfortunately. We would like to think that people wouldn't, but some people start to compromise. This is the separation, then, of those who merely name Christ and those who truly believe who will suffer for Christ. This is exactly what happened in the first century. We can see an example of this from Paul's life. He wrote, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Here's a guy named Demas, who got to travel with the, the Apostle Paul of all people. Could you imagine having the opportunity to travel with Paul. Yet he threw it away because he loved the world too much. He didn't want to go along with Paul and suffer with Paul and get shipwrecked with Paul and uh, suffer the, the lashings that Paul got. He didn't want to deal with the hardships, perhaps, that Paul faced. And so he deserted Paul. This is something we see today as well, isn't it? apostasy. As soon as the pressure is turned up just a little bit, as soon as you're called to make a hard decision, as soon as you realize that you must give up things that you really love in the name of Christ, whether they're good things or not, people fall away. In fact, these people who apostatize would often turn in the real Christians to be arrested, as one ancient historian notes. Christians would apostatize, and then, hoping to line their own pockets, they snitch on the Christians that um, are still meeting. 
this agrees with what Jesus said would happen. They will betray and hate one another. As we have touched on false prophets in verse 11, when we are examining verse 5, we'll continue to verse 12, which deals with lawlessness. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The last few points are tied together, and if you think about it, it makes sense. Christians are hated. People then leave the church because Christians are hated and persecuted. Some follow false teachers. Some leave religion altogether. And since they've left the church and do not abide in the teachings of Christ, lawlessness abounds. And love shrinks. Now what is lawlessness? Well, it's not abiding by God's law. And the Bible tells us that sin is lawlessness. So if you don't follow what God says, you're in sin. So we might say that we see sin abound, sin increase. We see an increase in what God hates in the world. When there's an increased abandonment of God's moral law. People become indifferent towards God and other people. They grow cold and they increase in their sin. And we see lawlessness and a disregard for what God's law said, says as a huge issue today. And we've seen it throughout the century. So these are seven or eight things that Christ says will happen just at the very beginning of the end. We've been in the end times since the resurrection. We're not in the very, very end, but we've been in what the Bible calls the end time since the resurrection. And these signs were the very, very, very beginning of the end. And they will continue on until the end, but they are not the signs for us to see at the very, very, very end. We'll get to that later. You've gotten a bit of a history lesson up to this point. This hasn't been like most sermons that, that we've done. So we must ask then, what is the application? We've talked about wars, we've talked about famines, we've talked about Roman emperors. What's the application then? I'm not a Jew living in the first century. I don't need to worry about the temple being destroyed. It was destroyed centuries ago. Centuries and centuries ago. Why do I care? Well, there are a few things to consider. God's word is always fruitful. So one of the applications is seen in verse 6. Jesus says, See that you are not alarmed. See that you are not alarmed. Why? Why should we not be alarmed? Why should we not be concerned? Well, Jesus shows us in this passage that God has a plan, right? God uh, made a plan before the world was formed. Jesus knew about this plan. The apostles asked Christ what was going to happen. Christ, knowing this plan, told the apostles exactly what would happen. We just went through a list of these things that were to happen, and everything that Christ said was correct. This proves to us, then, that God has a plan. Christ knew about it and told the apostles about it. it turned out to be true. And if everything goes, then, according to God's plan, we should not be alarmed the next time we hear about these things in the world. Wars, famines, persecution, lawlessness. We shouldn't have anxiety about it. You must remember that this has been part of the plan from before the world was formed. Earlier in the service, we read from Ephesians 1, how God works everything out in accordance with his will. Before the earth was formed, God had a plan. By his providence, he has carried out everything perfectly in accordance with his will and plan. You don't need to panic. God is in control. That's easy to say when circumstances are not difficult. I realize that. But the truth remains the truth, whether you're in difficulty or in an easy time of your life. God is in control and he has a plan. 
And I think it is so cool to step back and examine this passage from a historical context and see, yeah, everything that Christ said happened. God's plan worked out. That's amazing. That's amazing. That should create in us more trust in God. Christ reveals to us just this little, little bit of God's plan. And we see it happen to the T. We should then, we should trust God. Second, we should be in awe of God's character. We should be left in awe. We change our plans all the time. We have to make adjustments. Sometimes we tell someone we will do something, but circumstances prevent us from doing them. We say, hey man, I'll meet you at 7 at so-and-so place, and then we have to text them later and say, hey, I'm running a little late. We have to adjust our plan. Sometimes we have to cancel on people. We have to tell people that we're unable to do what we planned. But God is not like this. God always executes his plan. He is sovereign. He is in control. Not only should this comfort us and give us peace, but we should also consider God's character more deeply. We should be uh, left worshiping God after we read this passage. That in his providence, he worked all these things out. All these wars and all this uh, political friction between Rome and Israel, or Rome and uh, Jerusalem or Judea, to have the temple be destroyed in 70 AD because Christ said that it would happen within the generation of the people who were alive in 30 AD. A generation was typically 40 years. So he said in about 30 AD, the temple would be destroyed in this generation. Four years later, the temple is destroyed. Isn't it amazing how God works out things so perfectly? I'm left in awe when I study prophecy. Uh, and, and when we see this in scripture, it just works out. I'm left in awe and I'm left worshiping God. Now, congregation, we should also consider the last two verses of this section. I hope you didn't think that I forgot about them. As there is a last prediction of Christ that was fulfilled in this section. Verse 13 and 14 say, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. This is a spiritual promise. If you will endure all these difficulties, you will be saved from God's coming wrath. If you cling to Christ and do not and, and are not led astray, you will be saved. Christ predicted that the gospel would spread throughout the world. Now, we might be sitting back here in the 21st century and say, yeah, of course it did. But you have to remember that Israel was one very small country among a, uh, among a, a, a world that believed in other gods, primarily. There were very few, there were some, but there were very few non ethnically Jewish believers in the Old Testament era who believed in the true God. There were some, but there were very few. Certainly, the gospel was spread around the known world before 70 AD. We can read about that in the book of Acts. We can read about how Paul went around the Mediterranean and preached Christ. We don't know too much from the scriptures about what all the apostles did um, we have secular history that tells us, which isn't infallible, especially the details surrounding this particular topic. One church historian writes, tradition, and I just want to note it's tradition, so it could be right, it could be wrong. Tradition assigns the following fields to the various apostles and evangelists. Bartholomew is said to have brought the gospel according to Matthew to India. The, the tradition concerning Matthew is rather confused. He is said to have preached to his own people, 
and afterward in foreign lands. James Alpheus is said to have worked in Egypt. Thaddeus is said to have been the missionary to Persia. Simon is said to have worked in Egypt and in Britain, while another report connects him with Persian, uh, Persian and Babylonia. The evangelist John Mark is said to have founded the church in Alexandria. And again, this is secular history. It's unconfirmed tradition, so take it with a grain of salt. But we do know that Paul, again, shared the gospel in many places and regions. And we can see by historic evidence that the gospel did spread around the world. The gospel is still spread around the world in this period as well. Um, think about it. Here we stand on the other side of the world. Most of us, if not all of us, Gentiles and not Jews, reading about Jesus from Matthew's account, an account that was written in the first century by a former tax collector. Isn't that amazing? So will you believe in this gospel of Christ? It was God's plan all along for you to hear my voice on this very day in which you hear it. Will you then turn to Christ and be saved? I plead with you that you would do so. Spare yourself an eternity of suffering by turning to him and throwing away your old life. If you do so and endure to the end, as our text says, you will be saved.